Live. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, today we're looking at the drone papers, an explosive new expose by The Intercept based on a cache of secret documents that expose the inner workings of the U.S. military's assassination program in Afghanistan, Yemen and Somalia. It raises the question, is there a new Edward Snowden? We're joined by three reporters who worked on the Drone Papers. Cora Courier, a staff reporter for The Interceptor, contributions to the Drone Papers series include the pieces The Kill Chain and Firing Blind. Ryan Devereaux, also a staff reporter at The Intercept, wrote Man Hunting in the Hindu Kush. Also still with us for the hour, Jeremy Scahill, co-founder of The Intercept, author of um, uh, is also author on this series, Cora Courier. I wanted to turn to your piece, The Kill List. How do the targets get chosen? So this is the first time that we've seen documentary evidence of how the Obama White House picks and uh, chooses targets for uh, to kill them by drone or any other or other kinds of airstrikes. And this is for operations in Yemen and Somalia. And the slide that we have shows how task force personnel, so people working on the ground in uh, in Yemen or Somalia, JSOC task force personnel, uh, working with other intelligence community members, establish make a, a package on a target, on a potential target, um, collecting intelligence, doing reconnaissance. So these people are already under surveillance of, of various types. And then they put them together, they package them in what they call a baseball card uh, on the target. And that passes up the ranks of the military, up the chain of command. It goes through the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of Defense, then sends them to the White House. Um, and there they're examined by councils of, of uh, senior administration officials uh, known as the Principals Committee, which is of the National Security Council, which is basically sort of all the top cabinet heads of the, of the Obama administration, all his closest advisors. Um, and their deputies, which is the, called the Deputies Committee. And that's reportedly where actually a lot of the work gets done, where they really pour over the, the targets and they think about sort of the uh, both the legal cases and also the, the sort of political ramifications and, and reasons uh, to kill or not to kill somebody. So this is all happening in this, this sort of really uh, interagency process happens at the White House. And then we know from outside reporting that this is the time when, uh, during the period of this study in 2000, 12, 2013, John Brennan, uh, who became, then became CIA director, was super influential in these discussions, and it was often him that was bringing the, the, the baseball cards to the president to finally sign off on giving JSOC operatives then a 60-day window to go after the target. The baseball cards? Mm -hmm. So they would sign off on uh, a, a package, what they called it, a targeting, uh, an operations package, which would have the baseball card, which was all the intelligence on the target, and then a sort of concept of operations about how they might go about getting them. Uh, and then they'd have a 60-day window in which they could take a strike against the target. And uh, that is counter to some previous reporting about whether or not the president sort of per you hear this this rhetoric that the president personally signs off on each drone strike. It's not clear that that's exactly what uh, what what was meant by that. It, it seems more likely that he signs off on these packages, and then the actual decision to take a strike goes through the military chain of command. And a key part of these uh, baseball cards is are the SIM cards and the cell phone numbers and, uh, and in other words, the uh, signals intelligence attached to each of these individuals? Right. It's going to have, you know, everything that they know about them, so, you know, from a variety of sources. And one thing that we learned in the documents is that they are heavily reliant on signals intelligence, heavily reliant on communications intelligence to build a picture of who they think this person is and why they think he's important. Now, in your piece, The Kill Chain, the lethal bureaucracy behind Obama's drone war, um, you talk about the different um, officials who sign off. Jeremy mentioned earlier, for example, the Treasury Secretary. Why would the Treasury Secretary be involved with naming who should be killed? Well, I think in practice, I mean, in by the letter, the Principals Committee of the National Security Council includes all of these, all of these uh, top officials, like the Treasury Secretary, like the Secretary of Energy. Is the Secretary of Energy actually really, you know, a deciding factor in who gets killed in Yemen? No, it's going to be the, you know, the, the Hillary, the Hillary Clinton at the time was of this study was, uh, you know, 
Secretary of State, and she, you know, she would sort of represent the State Department's opinions about this. Again, would she actually probably have all the background on these individuals? No, it would have been prepared for her by, you know, uh, her second in commands or whoever was below her, and they would sort of be representing the views of their agency. So, while the, all those cabinet members are on paper in the on the uh, principals committee, in practice, it was a smaller circle of advisors. Now, Jeremy, so the president is making these decisions, and the others below him. Based on I mean, it's very much shaped on the information he's getting on his desk. Right, and I mean, you know, one of the things that we also see in the documents is that uh, a great deal of the intelligence that they're basing these packaging packages on uh, come from foreign uh, intelligence sources, and so it could be from the Saudis, it could be from you know Yemenis, it could be from another entity from, from the Saudis, for example, who want a uh, uh, protester, a pro-democracy protester, did. Right, right. And it, I mean, well, that's yes, that's part of it. But it's but, you know, more specifically to this, uh, you know, there are cases where it seems as though the U.S. was intentionally fed bad intelligence uh, to in, in the effort to try to eliminate a domestic political opponent of the former dictator of Yemen, for instance, where someone that was actually uh, trying to negotiate with Al Qaeda, but was a political opponent of the Yemeni dictator at the time, Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, was killed in a U.S. drone strike, and it, it you know, it's, it seems quite likely um, that it was, you know, Yemen had fed that intelligence to try to eliminate one of their opponents. I mean, the WikiLeaks cables were rife with examples uh, of the Yemeni president trying to get the United States to take up his own. Uh, you know, political cause against the Houthis at the time, who are now controlling parts of Yemen. Um, but the, the, you know, the Saudis are, have a huge influence over who the U.S. targets um, in that region, and you know, foreign intelligence. They have their own agenda, and we're, if we're basing a lot of of our decision on who should sort of live or die in these cases on foreign intelligence and unreliable signals intelligence, it raises serious questions about who we're actually killing. Well, the it seems to me the other aspect of this, as your report shows, is that the government's own. Uh, uh, reviews shows uh, uh, states the unreliability of this information. So you're, they're not only making decisions without any kind of judicial process to kill people. The evidence that they're using, they themselves acknowledge, is unreliable. Well, remember, this is this, this uh, task force, uh, the ISR task force that did these studies that are in you know the document. And ISR stands for uh, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, and uh, and so this task force is basically an advocacy wing for more drones, more surveillance platforms. And, and so you have to view it in the context of uh, this is the Pentagon trying to get all the toys and to make themselves, you know, the boss of everything. And they largely are the boss of everything because they have the biggest budget and they have the most personnel. Um, but what they're, you know, what, what the point there is, is that th there's this not so subtle agitation to start being able to do a lot more capturing. Um, I think it's true what they're saying about the unreliability of it, but there's also a, you know there's a turf war at play here with the CIA. So I think you have to you have to take it with a grain of salt and and read it in the context of that. Now the issue of innocent civilians. I mean, there's also an issue of the people who they believe are absolutely guilty, whether or not Cora, um, the president should be the judge and the jury and the executioner. But the, this percentage that Juan raised earlier of 90 percent innocents killed in a drone strike, explain further what you learned on who lives and who dies. So what was actually striking about the, the Pentagon study, which was one of the documents that we had, Ryan um, looked in detail at, at these campaigns in Afghanistan, where that 90 percent figure comes from. Um, in Yemen and Somalia, in this Pentagon study, they actually it was pretty striking for how little they talk about civilian casualties, how little uh, it seems to be um, an issue. They, they're, the whole gist of the study was give us, as Jeremy was saying, give us more drones, give us better equipment so that we can get these high-value targets. And there was sort of little discussion of what the consequences are if you hit the—of hitting the wrong person. It was more about, like, we've got to be more efficient at getting the, the people that we want. And, uh, and there was very little mention of civilian, of civilian casualties. There were a few times that it mentioned that low CDE, or collateral damage estimate, which is military speak for, for uh, how many civilians might be harmed, um, was mentioned a few times as kind of a restraining factor on, on strikes and something that was explaining why they were moving more slowly, because they had these low CDE requirements. And that's actually really—that 
word, that uh, standard, low CD, is interesting because at the same time as this study was circulated in May 2013 was when the president gave his big speech about how before the U.S. would take a strike, there had to be near certainty that no civilians would be harmed or injured. And near certainty is not the same as low CD. Um, and the White House told us that, that you know, the, the standards of the May 2013 speech are still in place, but they wouldn't explain that discrepancy um, as to why these internal documents at the same time had this different standard for civilian And deaths. Jeremy Skeho, what was the White House's reaction to this explosive series? Um, well, you know, the, the, the White House was, uh, you know, basically said, we're not going to comment on uh, purported uh, internal documents. and. You know, I mean, Ryan had sort of a funny interaction with the Special Operations Command that he can explain. But at the end of the day, the Pentagon ended up you know, being the one that kind of spoke for all of them and said, you know, these are internal classified documents and we're not going to speak about it. I mean, they'll speak about classified material all the time when it benefits their, you know, position, like John Brennan leaking things after bin Laden. But, you know, they're not going to address these things. Or even, I mean, Cora had very concrete questions. Is this still the case? Is this true? You know, they, they, would, they wouldn't answer a single question. We're going to go to break and then come back. And when we come back, um, we're going to talk about Afghanistan. And that's where Ryan Devereaux comes in uh, with President Obama now reversing course. The longest war in U.S. history is about to get longer. How do the drone papers weigh in here? What do they tell us about Afghanistan? And much more. We're speaking with three of the authors of this series, this stunning series at The Intercept, Jeremy Scahill, Ryan Devereaux and Cora Courier. Stay with us.